Good evening. Whoever did that, good. Uh, you always look for the extra points, don't you? Uh, to our students sharing their research during the poster session of this event, we thank you for your innovative ideas and hard work. I know Dr. Travis Malone, who is the Ann B. Schumadine Dean of the Baton Honors College and his committee of guest judges, had a very hard time picking the three finalists. Um, I'd like to introduce senior staff and special guests who are here with us tonight. Uh, first, Sue Larkin, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs. John Grew, Vice President for Finance. Keith Moore, Senior Vice President. Kelly Cordova, Chief of Staff and Vice President for Strategic Initiatives. And Heather Campbell, Vice President for Enrollment. Also joining us tonight are our Board Chair, John Pruden and Board Vice Chair Nancy DeFord. I'd especially like to recognize the family who's made all of this possible. The Baton Honors College is named in gratitude for Virginia Wesleyan Trustee Emerita Jane P. Batten and her late husband, Frank Batten Sr. Uh, Jane could not join us this evening, but she congratu congratulates all of our student participants and wishes our three finalists the best of luck. The Baton Honors College continues to exceed even Jane's and our highest expectations. As you can tell from the poster session, the Baton Honors College students are bright, they're motivated, and they're determined to make this world a better place. We congratulate them. That's why we could not be more thankful to Louie and Prudence Ryan for recognizing the character of our, Bat of our Baton scholars and challenging them to pursue excellence for the greater good through the Louis and Prudence Ryan Environmental Research Symposium and Prize. Louis Ryan has been a dedicated member of the VWU Board of Trustees since 2007. He and his wife Prudence dedicated, a, decided a number of years ago to support their primary areas of interest, the environment and education. Both of these areas meet in the Baton Honors College. When this group of students competed for the 40 coveted spots in the Baton Honors College back in 2019-2020 academic year, I told them that their education and experiences in the Baton Honors College at Virginia Wesleyan would prepare them to solve problems creatively, think globally, make connections, and work towards a better world. As such, tonight's presentation of the Ryan Environmental Research Symposium and Prize is a culmination of Jane's vision for an honors college with a globally important purpose. We're also so grateful that the Ryans believed in Jane's vision and generously created an endowment to fund this symposium and the Ryan Prize. It's going to be a great night. I'd now like to invite Dr. Craig Wansink, Batten Professor of Religious Studies and the Joan P. and Macon F. Brock Jr. Director of the Robert Nussbaum Center to give tonight's blessing. Okay. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for this earth, our home. Awaken us, awaken in us renewed commitment to care for it and each other. Help us to turn from selfish consumption of resources meant for all and to see the impact of our choices on the poor and vulnerable. Inspire leaders to act courageously, urgently, and wisely so that our common home may be healed and restored. This evening, we give thanks for the Ryans and for new beginnings and possibilities. We pray for the students this evening. We pray for all those here at Virginia Wesleyan who think creatively and relentlessly, envisioning a new future and becoming instruments of a new hope. Eternal God, finally, stir all of our hearts into action. Inspire us with ways we can make a difference in our homes, communities, and the world around us. This we ask in your name. Amen. Please enjoy dinner.
We hope that everyone's enjoying their meal. We have a full program tonight, so we're going to start with some remarks from tonight's generous visionary, Louis Ryan. Louis and Prue regret that they could not be here tonight, but we're recording this event for them to watch at a later date. Dr. Malone, or Abby. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Louis Ryan, and I am pleased to add my welcome to all of you at this Environmental Research Symposium dinner and ultimately Environmental Research Prize. I've been asked to speak to you tonight uh, because my wife and I were involved in the creation of the symposium and dinner and prize. Um, and I've been asked to explain why it is that we thought that was a good thing for us to do. First of all, a very simple answer would be that I've been on the board of trustees at Virginia Wesleyan for a goodly number of years, and therefore I have a loyalty to the school. I didn't go here as a student, but as a member of the Board of Trustees, uh, I get to see the school, I get to see its development, and I develop an enthusiasm for it. The second reason is because Scott Miller and David Black asked me to, and I don't know how many of you know them very well, but I've never found the energy to say no to those guys. So that would be the second simple reason for, for my being involved with this. But the more substantive reason um, for each of those has to do with my wife and I's commitment to two causes above all others. And those two causes are education and the environment. And obviously, this symposium is the intersection of those two interests. So let me just take a second to explain why I'm interested in those two things. Education is probably pretty obvious why that's a, a, of interest to me, um, because I'm speaking to an audience of people who are either involved in education as educators or students or parents of students uh, or otherwise interested in this university. So I don't need to go too deeply, but I'm gonna take this opportunity to, to go a little deeper than, than that and explain what I view as the primary benefit of education, both to individuals and to our society at large. And that is that a good education may teach you facts, it may teach you skills, and all of those can be important. But what a good education does, one hopes, is to teach you how to think. And the, what I mean by thinking is learning to think critically, creatively, and holistically. And doing that is really necessary to guarantee the survival and thriving of humanity. And the environment is the perfect place to both learn those skills and to practice them once you've learned them. The complexity of the environment, the interrelationship of very many aspects of the environment, requires anyone who's interested in preserving our environment so that we can survive and thrive uh, must look at many aspects because you solve a problem one place and it creates an issue somewhere else. So you need to have a full understanding of every aspect of how an environment works and how if you attempt to improve it, uh, you need to be mindful of the various ways that it might work and how what your efforts to improve one thing may cause a problem somewhere else. For instance, wind power is a wonderful way to avoid the use of fossil fuels. But when you put wind farms in a flyway for bird species, you may end up killing a lot of rare birds. So you need to think about that. You need to understand that kind of issue and see if there's a way to have it both ways. Another example is electric cars. A good idea? Yes, certainly. But research has shown that the creation of electric cars creates a bigger carbon footprint than uh, the creation of gasoline-powered cars. Now, the minute the cars start driving, the electric car starts regaining that benefit, but it may take 40, 60,000 or more miles before that benefit is regained, and it can be even worse if the electricity is generated through coal power. So these are just a couple of examples of 
how complex the environment is, how interrelated various parts of the environment are, and why it's essential that people who have an interest in the environment think critically, creatively, and holistically. So this symposium creates a natural opportunity for students and faculty, for that matter, to engage in this kind of thinking and to hopefully do meaningful research work that will add to our knowledge of the issues that we face with our environment and how we should go about dealing with those issues. So we are very pleased to be involved with this, to have our name associated with it, and we're thrilled to have Virginia Wesleyan University here in the greater Hampton Roads area, bringing fabulous students to work in many areas, but particularly in the environment. Thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to make these remarks, but I'm sorry I can't be at the dinner myself. Thank you. We do send our esteemed gratitude to Louis and Prudence for their generosity and their visionary support of this program. Uh, I'm Dr. Travis Malone, Ann B. Schumann, Dean of the Baton Honors College. It is my honor to work with the students of the Baton Honors College and all our students at Virginia Wesleyan University. The students of the Honors 480 class, the senior seminar class, are given a simple task. Develop a research paper, project, and poster that addresses one of the United Nations 17 goals for sustainable development. In the book Emergent Strategy, Adrian Marie Brown writes, at a human scale, in order to create a world for more people, for more life, we have to collaborate on the process of dreaming, envisioning, and implementing that world. We have to recognize that a multitude of realities have, do, and will exist. These posters and research projects here are attempts to do that, to put into practice these environmental sustainable goals, to dream, to visualize, and actualize real solutions towards a better globe. The more than 40 research papers and posters developed by both the fall and spring sections of the Honors 480 course were adjudicated by blind review by a campus committee, campus panel of Batten professors, VW faculty, and one member of the BHC junior cohort. The panel selected tonight's three finalists, and I would like to take a moment to thank those campus judges and the judges panel. I would also like to recognize Christian Palmasano, Christian, as the, it was elected to be on the, the campus panel by, his, uh, by the members of the Student Advisory Board. So thank you, Christian, for all your support and your adjudication of these projects in the midst of all your other great work and accomplishments you're doing on campus. The campus adjudication panel selected these three finalists and put their work, we recorded their presentations. The presentations were then, and research posters and the research papers were sent to our outside community adjudication panel. Our finals judges for this evening were Christy Everett, Hampton Roads Director of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. <laughs> Karen Forget, Executive Director of Lynn Haven River Now. <laughs> Teresa Augustin, Vice President of Education for the Norfolk Botanical Garden. At all steps in the project, these projects were judged on four criteria established by the donor. The potential impact of the project, as well as perhaps even the implementation of a given solution and the proof that there is possibilities beyond just dreaming a solution. Addressing the environmental complexities of not only the project, but the context to which the goal is placed, as well as to the solution is sustained. The strength of the evidence of the project, and the, and the ability of that presenter to communicate their ideals, their research, to a wide variety of audiences to really show their passion and power of being a more sustainable planet. This time, we're gonna turn it over to our Ryan finalists for they'll present their three works this evening. And in no particular order except for alphabetical because it was easier for me. <laughs> our first speaker of the evening is Brianna Mahoney.
Brianna is a driven researcher, writer, presenter, and creative artist. Brianna is set to graduate with a bachelor's degree in art, media, and communications in May, in May and is an Actus Campus community leader. Now, you can read her bio there, but a few other things. Uh, Brianna just returned last night on the train from Baltimore, having represented VWU in the Baton Honors College, the Next Generation Leadership Conference for I Love My Black Student Union in Baltimore. So thank you for your service as both a panelist and what you represented here for the Baton Honors College. And if you'd like to see more of Brandon's work that isn't just here and in just a few moments, you can go over to the Neil Britton Art, uh, the Berkeley Sheiks Gallery across in the Hofheimer Library and see her work on display as the art in the art uh, senior art exhibition. Um, and until uh, tonight, each of the finalists was asked to provide the name of a nonprofit environmental organization to which half of their winnings will be don donated in their honor. Uh, and those, those names remain secret until tonight uh, for obvious reasons. But uh, Brianna has chosen uh, the James River Association of Richmond as her nonprofit environmental organization. So at this time, I'll turn over to, to Brianna. Hello. Thank you all for having me. Um, tonight, I'll be presenting my research on how to broaden awareness of me on melanoma and skin of color on college campuses. Um, so just in general terms, um, melanoma is a deadly form of skin cancer that accounts for 75% of skin cancer deaths in the US. It's also one of the most common cancers in the United States. Thankfully, it's pretty easy, well not easy, but it's pretty feasible to treat in its earliest stages. Um, but unfortunately, due to disparities in the field of dermatology, on darker skin, uh, signs of melanoma are often caught later than on lighter skin. Uh, so you can see it in action. Well, the average white patient five years after diagnosis has a 92% chance of survival. Uh, the average black patient has a 70% chance of survival. Um, tackling this issue, I felt, is a necessary step to ensure the UN's third goal of sustainability, which has to do with ensuring healthy lives um, for people all around the globe. So just some data points about uh, the disparities in dermatology. Um, there are roughly 333.9 million American citizens, about 15% of which are black. Um, unfortunately, there are only about 11,640 dermatologists to treat all of these potential patients, only 3% of which are black. Um, patients can also potentially go more than two months without treatment because of this wide uh, gap between this large amount of population, of potential patients, and doctors that are there to treat them. Uh, the American Academy of Dermatology also suggests that dermatologists are understocked with the skills and the knowledge to treat ethnic patients just because the educational services uh, that the service that the association holds typically only covers white skin and barely covers anything having to do with ethnic skin. So this means that black patients uh, can go a long period of time without treatment and when they do go to see a doctor they typically won't have the skills needed to treat them or won't even have the baseline knowledge of having darker skin to understand how to address their needs. Uh, so the field of dermatology um, is, needs a lot of work in order to fix these disparities. But what we can do is to use the power of knowledge to empower patients and these vulnerable demographics to know the signs of melanoma and how to prevent melanoma so they've been caught early on and raise their chances of survival. Um, some simple things dermatologists encourage are using sunscreen, but unfortunately, there seems to be a bit of, not a rumor, but a bit of, uh, there, there's a misunderstanding within the black community and also within the world at large that darker skin is somehow immune uh, to sun damage. While darker skin may be less likely to burn uh, due to sun damage, um, the sun damage can still pierce the skin, UV and UVA rays, which can lead to developing melanoma. Um, dermatologists suggest that people wear SPF sunscreen of 30, um, but darker skin on average only has an SPF level of 13.4. So that means people can go into the sun thinking that they'll be immune to sun damage because they're less likely to be burned, but they're still developing sun damage, which can lead to developing melanoma. A dermatologist also encourages people to do self-skin examinations. Uh, just taking the time once a month, uh, usually after a shower or bath once you're clean, and using a mirror or a partner with you uh, to look over your body, see any changing moles on your body, any signs that something might be amiss. It's a great way to get a jump on melanoma and make sure that you're going to a doctor early on to get a jump on any sort of treatment that can uh, raise your chances of survival. Um, some initiatives to educate that are already in place include the SPOTS program, 
um, which was founded by the St. Louis School of Medicine and Washington University in 2006. Um, so the program goes across the country uh, teaching students in medical schools, but also in K through 12 schools about self skin examinations. Um, they use uh, the simple acronym ABCDE in order to convey this information. A standing for asymmetry. If a spot is asymmetrical in some way, that might be a cause for concern. If the border of a mole is crooked in some way, that's something to look out for. If the color of, is off, if it's red or green or blue, that's obviously wrong. Um, so you still see a doctor about that. Uh, D stands for the diameter. So if a spot is larger uh, than the diameter of a pencil eraser, um, that's something to, to look out for. And E can stand for two things. It can stand for evolving, so if the spot is changing anyway, if next month it's about two, it's about two times larger as it was last month, then look out for that. And also, if it's elevated, so if a spot is a bit moving up on your plane, that's something to look out for. And using this easy acronym to remember and also to convey, um, the SPOTS program goes across the states teaching people this. Other forms, to edu uh, other forms of education include using social media. Uh, programs like the WHO and the CDC use social media to reach people worldwide um, about things such as like COVID measures and things like that. Um, more locally in the US, uh, the Skin Cancer Foundation has an official Instagram which uses the tag, hashtag love your skin, protect your skin um, to tag all of its posts. So if you follow that tag or follow the Instagram, it'll get information about melanoma, about the stats of it and about early pre prevention and treatment. Uh, so I was inspired um, by these um, forms of intervention and also by Pfizer's goals um, for using Pfizer's guidelines for creating effective uh, tools of PSAs um, and public messaging uh, to create my own PSA. So I created a campaign of PSAs displayed on campus and also online. Uh, the first you can see uh, was displayed on campus in the school library. Um, these focus about things like melanoma uh, and skin self-examinations and wearing sunscreen. Um, I also use a QR code um, on the poster in the library that would lead to a link tree leading to resources from official melanoma associated um, organizations so that people can continue to learn more about melanoma and more about keeping themselves safe after this project is over. So here are some of the designs. I tried my best to keep them simple and also attract people's eyes. Um, so focusing on sunscreen, uh, dispelling myths about darker skin and about the problem at hand and how serious it is. And also what people can do, um, doing self skin examinations, doing simple things like asking their, asking their barber or their hairstylist to take a look at their scalp because those are things that can be hard to look at yourself. And I also put brochures available um, from the Melanoma Foundation and the Skin Cancer Foundation for people to take with them and also share with their friends. Additionally, I worked with the Marlin Chronicle, which is our school's newspaper, woo, Marlin Chronicle. Um, <laughs> they have a social media platform uh, where students uh, follow and to look at our, like, our monthly or a regularly scheduled um, newspaper releases. Um, I've worked in tandem with them and asked them if they could please put it on their story so that people could learn more about melanoma and how to protect themselves. So I've reformatted things a little bit for social media but generally kept the same information. I also covered how Bob Marley died of melanoma at only 36, year old, 36 years old um, from ALM, which is a form of melanoma, which specifically uh, seems to be targeting, seems to be more prone in people of African ancestry. So that's something to be aware of. And at the end, I um, motioned for people to follow the hashtag love your skin, protect your skin hashtag, and also follow uh, at skincancer.org, um, just so people can follow the experts and learn more about this project after it's over. I also coordinated with VWU's Residence Life in order to get, um, in order to work with um, RAs so that they would put posters about spotting skin cancer in people's um, dorms and just that they'd be able to encounter in their daily lives and hopefully in integrate it into their monthly routines. Um, for further forms of action, I would really love if VWU could work with existing organizations, existing organizations such as SPOTS to bring this knowledge onto college campuses and have workshops even with our BSU on campus so that we can target specifically our black um, population who is vulnerable to this disparity. Um, and also organizing promoting scholarship funds for black students to perform degrees in the field of medicine such as dermatology. Uh, just having more researchers and having more people um, with baseline knowledge about having darker skin in the field could really fill the gap of research. 
and kind of revolutionized the field of dermatology and hopefully the medical, medical field overall. Um, and thank you all for coming. Thank you so much um, to all of the professors who helped me with this. And Thank you, Brianna. Our second presenter, in alphabetical order by last name, Edward McDonald. During his time at VW, Eddie served as a student government president, captain of the men's swim team, and a fellow in the Baton Honors College. This spring, Eddie will receive his Bachelor's of Science in Sustainability Management, as well as his Bachelor of Arts, two different degrees, in political science this spring. Next fall, Eddie will continue his education at Duke University's Nicholas School for the Environment, where he'll pursue his Master's of Environmental Management in a partnership program that we have with Duke University. The nonprofit Eddie has chosen to support throughout uh, for his, for his uh, finalist opportunity this evening is the Sea Shepherd Cons Conservation Society. At this time, I'll turn it over to Edward McDonald. this one? That one. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I'm here to talk to you about localized solutions to glass recycling in urbanized coastal communities. So uh, glass, a quick history. Uh, so 4,000 years ago, ancient Mesopotamians discovered how to make glass, and that was pretty revolutionary. Um, after all, you all are drinking out of glass bottles today. Um, but then 2,000 years later, the ancient Roman Empire had developed a pretty complex circular economy where sand-rich nations such as Egypt and Israel would produce the glass, send it over to glass-consuming <laughs> nations such as um, Northern Europe, and once it was there, it would stay there and be repurposed by local artisans. Uh, 400 years ago, England developed leaded glass, which paved the way for industrialization, and today, glass is widely available. However, uh, there's been quite a change from the circular economy of the Roman Empire to a very linear economy. For example, in my hometown of Chesapeake, uh, when we canceled our curbside recycling program, uh, we have localized um, depot areas, but those areas don't even collect glass recycling. So uh, this problem is confounded when we have a triple threat for an increased need of sand. And that triple threat is erosion, sand depletion, and rising sea levels. First, I want to talk about erosion. So the sand cycle has been massively disrupted, and a lot of that has to do with the sand supply chain coming from terrestrial ecosystems and moving down to our coastal environments. Uh, facilities such as dams and also uh, coastal habitation have really disrupted that. Uh, furthermore, increased storm events have led to uh, increased erosion along the coast. Next, we have sand depletion. So the United Nations has actually called sand the world's second most exploited resource, only after water. And they did, in their studies, they discovered that 50 billion tons are extracted every single year. And when you do the math, that's about 40 pounds per person per day, which is just an astronomical number. And this is also ex uh, extremely important when we realize that uh, wind form sand is different than water form sand, so resources like deserts are unavailable for economic use. And then thirdly, we have rising sea levels. So as we know, uh, sea levels are on the rise uh, and predicted to rise between a few inches and a few feet over the next coming decades. Uh, and coastal communities such as Hampton Roads are particularly at risk as we see uh, tidal flooding uh, and daytime flooding is a big issue and also coastal fortification. So our solutions to climate change can actually make it worse. So that is the triple threat that we have right there. And on top of the wasteful consumption, we also, or on top of the increased need for sand, we also have wasteful consumption. So landfill excess, as well as sand exploitation at the same time. So every year, 6 .6, or 7.6 million tons of sand are thrown away into landfills. And while that's happening, we're simultaneously mining the dunes along the Great Lakes, as well as the beaches on California to replace that sand that we're throwing away. So obviously, that is a major issue. Uh, for example, in Hampton Roads, uh, sand or glass that we throw away is often used as coverage on landfills to prevent the garbage from just blowing away in the wind instead of being reused into new materials. So uh, why don't we recycle glass? Uh, there's two main issues, logistics and economics. So logistically, uh, glass is very fragile and often breaks in the supply chain uh, when we're collecting all of recycling. Um, additionally, it is uh, very heavy. So 
uh, I think you'd be surprised to know that we don't have a glass manufacturing plant in our state. So any glass that you recycle, if it's actually going to be repurposed into new materials, it has to be sent to either Pennsylvania or North Carolina to be smelted down into a new material. And glass is very heavy and not as valuable as other materials like metal. So that makes it uh, economically prohibitive to do that. So what are the solutions? Uh, logistically, we can do a multi-stream recycling system. So you can see here, we have a purple dumpster. Uh, this is in the city of Alexandria, and that is a recycling um, collection place, and purple dumpsters are only for glass. So that prevents glass from being contaminated by other recycling uh, in the recycling stream. And also to prevent us from finding a solution that we have to ship our glass out of state, we need a localized solution for all of this glass waste. So my solution was recycling glass into glass sand. So there's a couple unique uh, advantages to using recycled sand or recycled glass as sand. Uh, so first of all, it's a pretty established process. Uh, when we're recycling glass, we crush it and tumble it and then remelt it down. So when we're turning it into sand, we just have to tumble it into the desired grain size. It can also be heated to round off the sharp edges. So this is an established practice that we already have in place. Uh, one of people's major concerns is matching the native sand. So obviously you don't want your beaches to be blue or green. You want them to look the same. Uh, so color matching technology, such as when you're uh, matching color in your house at Home Depot, you scan your color and you want it to be the, the same. Uh, that technology can be used to determine the color mix of brown and white glass. Uh, so native sand uh, is similar to the recycled glass sand. And additionally, there are some very interesting environmental benefits. Uh, recycled glass sand has a lower wave coefficient, which means less erosion, so that's super advantageous. Additionally, uh, depending on the grain size, recycled glass sand can have improved moisture retention, which is really beneficial for uh, coastal dunes and encouraging vegetation growth, which also uh, helps against uh, climate resilience. So uh, even more benefits. Uh, environmentally is typically when we're restoring sand along the coast, uh, that's coming from dredging, which is very bad for the environment as sand or silt dunes can destroy the sea floor bed uh, flora and fauna. Um, additionally, studies have shown that uh, dredging actually makes erosion worse by deepening the sand channel and increasing the water speed. Uh, furthermore, studies on recycled glass sand have shown that there are no negative geotechnical biological, abiotic, or chemical variances between recycled glass sand and native sand, mostly because they're the same material. And in Virginia Beach, every year we spend about $15 million on beach restoration. And that's in addition to large uh, operations like Operation Big Beach, which took $153 million to complete. Now, uh, beach restoration is known to be a good place for public dollars because for every dollar we invest in coastal hardening, municipalities generate $5.86 in economic activity. But can we spend our municipal dollars better by capturing this uh, local waste? And that's where we have implementation. So first of all is stakeholder engagement. So Hampton Roads has a very rich history of grassroots collaborative partnerships, such as the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, uh, the Lynn Haven River Project. And if we can establish local glass processing facilities, that would be extremely beneficial in order to prevent us from shipping this waste out of state. Um, and developing a multi-stream recycling program, and that can be as easy as spray painting dumpsters purple. It's that simple. Um, and then we can incentivize glass recycling through community education programs. People are much more likely to recycle their glass if they know that the glass that they're taking the time to put in a special purple dumpster is going to protect their community and harden their beaches. Uh, and according to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the best way to protect the environment and coastal uh, communities is with dunes, with sand venting, and vegetation. And as I mentioned, uh, glass or recycled glass sand has some adv uh, advantages when it comes to vegetation. Um, additionally, we can supplement these uh, local colors that might not be used in the native sand color mix to uh, supplement our local uh, art scene that we have in the Hampton Roads area. In conclusion, the, tr the need to transition to a circular glass economy is absolutely clear and uh, localized Solutions, such as recycled glass waste in Hampton Roads, addresses multiple of these issues. By harnessing grassroots advocacy and community engagement, uh, we can spearhead this effort for a innovative solution to protect our environment, safeguard our shorelines, and conserve resources for future generations. Uh, these are my references. <laughs> there were quite a bit, uh, and that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eddie.
Our third final and finalist for this evening is Rianne Tremontana. Rianne is a senior in the Baton Honors College, majoring in international relations, Hispanic studies, and religious studies, three majors. Uh, she's proud editor-in-chief of the Marlin Chronicle, the student newspaper at Virginia Wesleyan. And during her college experience, Rianne was interned with the NATO Innovation Hub, participated in the Model United Nations in New York City, and attended conferences for research and journalism. And the Marlin Chronicle has received, yet again, every year, many awards. So congratulations to, to your leadership at the Marlin Chronicle. Rianne has also studied abroad in Barcelona, Spain, and Alsante, Spain, and hopes to continue her international education after graduation. The nonprofit Rianne has chosen for this evening is the Group for the East End, a Long Island conservation organization. This time, Rianne Tramontana. Good evening, everyone. Um, Today I'll be presenting on the implementation of opioid education at Virginia Wesleyan. This project has become immensely important to me and I thank you all for taking the time to be here. And I especially thank Dr. Schwinnika and Dr. Malone for helping me out every step of the way. So, to begin. Um, the opioid epidemic has been hitting the United States quite harshly in the past couple years. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, has marked a sharp increase, particularly from 2019 to 2020 and on. So between that time period, the number of people who died of 100,000 people, the number of opioid overdose deaths, rose from 35.6 to 47.3. Um, and in addition, we're seeing similar rises in opioid deaths in Virginia Beach as well. So this past August, um, the Virginia Beach Police Chief, Paul Newdigate, spoke to 13 News Now about the fact that there were 13 opioid overdoses in Virginia Beach in the first nine days of August. And he said, the fact is that it's younger folks, and younger folks are not within the normal range. Something is going on not indicative of what we normally see at the beach. So aside from having opioid deaths across the nation, we are also seeing opioid overdose deaths in younger populations. Um, from 1999 to 2018, the number of young adults ages 13 to 25 who were dying from polysubstance involved opioid deaths, long words, just means from multiple um, dead drugs in one synthetic opioid or cocaine. So the number of, of young adults dying from this rose by 760%. More recently, in the past few decades, we've seen that the age group 24, 25 to 34 has risen from the third highest age group of people dying to the second highest age group of people dying. That's seen here. So that light blue line, it kind of shoots up with the rest of the lines, but it rises above the 35 to 44 age group. So we're seeing younger people dying. And given that colleges and universities have a high concentration of younger populations, we have this untapped potential to be educating people on how they can keep themselves safe and the people around them safe for when, when they will probably, most likely, at some point witness someone who is overdosing from opioids. This is also an international problem, so these sustainable development goals focus on a lot more than um, we typically think. Target 3.5 relates to drug use specifically with the goal to strengthen the prevention and treatment of substance abuse, including narcotic drug abuse and harmful use of alcohol. So it's a national problem. It's an international problem. How is it a local problem? I spoke with the Chesapeake's narco narcotics detective, Ethan Dreyer, during my research, and he said something that was similarly powerful to me. We would rather deal with someone who's struggling with an overdose and save their life than have to respond for somebody who's no longer there to tell their story. So what he's emphasizing is a people-centric approach. How can we localize this issue to save one life instead of trying to fix the world? We have a couple breakable barriers that I think Virginia Wesleyan can focus on on our campus. That would be education, the societal stigma surrounding opioids, and of course, the biggest enemy for college students, which is time. Um, so I did a couple of different case studies, starting with Columbia University, a 2023 study used a lot of different student focus groups that discussed the usefulness and acceptance of these opioid awareness programs that they wanted to implement. And the suggestions from the students themselves were to focus on fraternities and sororities, student athletes, current clubs, and organizations, and maybe use the research as a class responsibility, which we do on Virginia Wesleyan already. In Marymount University, um, they began educating students on how to use naloxone after Virginia, uh, the state of Virginia declared a state of emergency in 2018 regarding the opioid crisis. 
So naloxone, which we commonly see as Narcan, which is the brand name, is the only way to reverse an opioid overdose. It can be administered intranasally, so through your nose, um, and it's very safe. You can administer it to me right now, and I would be perfectly fine. It has no harmful effects. But it is the only way to reverse an op overdose, so we need to have people on the scene to kind of administer that if something is happening. So they, in a few years, were able to train hundreds of community members and had 39 different Narcan supplies around their campus. As a side note, naloxone is a schedule for drug. It is restricted. Um, you can only have it at registered distribution sites. However, we do have resources for that as well. It's a, something we can tackle. So through my research, I found that there were five educational necessities that I wanted to focus on for students in particular. The first being Good Samaritan laws. A study published in the Journal of Medical Toxicology found that even though we encourage people to call 911 when there is an overdose, people only call EMS about 10 to 60 percent of the time, which is a very wide range, but it really proves that we can be doing better. We can be getting people help. And the Good Samaritan laws protect bystanders and people needing care from being arrested or charged, even if there are extraneous drugs at the scene. The primary the primary problem is keeping this person safe without charging them for something that the police don't want to get into at that point. Um, next would be the signs of an overdose. So you can't call 911 unless you know what's going on. The signs of an overdose are easily transmittable through posters, presentations, um, word of mouth, things like that. And this poster is a good example of it as well. Um, typically, when someone is overdosing, people might think that it's because of another drug. You can't put someone in the shower if they're having an overdose. You can't just give them water. You need naloxone. And so knowing those differences in what an overdose looks like for opioids is incredibly important. Next we have the concept of dangerous substances. So illicit substances are often um, laced into pills or other forms. In the Virginia Beach and Hampton Roads area, it's very common that we see gel caps, which is different from other areas of Virginia and other areas of, of the nation. So that's an important fact that students should know. In addition, you can buy a pill press on Amazon for about $20 and lace pills with something that you're getting. People tend to think that drugs are coming from some mythical place. They, can, they are right around us. There, is, there are dangerous drugs in our community, and students should be aware that what they're taking is not always what they think it is. Furthermore, students should know that they're not alone. So we have on-campus resources with our counseling center. The counseling center is anonymous, and in addition, you can speak to them if you are concerned about a friend, and the counseling center will do a wellness check, so that's just contacting the student, seeing if they need help. Sometimes all it takes is just a hand reaching out. And then finally, we have off-campus resources. So Curb the Crisis, Revive, and the State Opioid Response Program all will provide recovery and treatment options, as well as naloxone training, and more education for students who want to know more. We can also, of course, provide the emergency response number, which is 988. So for our campus, there's a very simple methodology. Um, I would love to see an education program focusing on student athletes and resident assistants, student athletes in particular, because when student athletes are injured, oftentimes they are given um, pills, opioids, um, and they become they sort of have this idea that it's not dangerous because they've taken pills for injuries, they can take pills at a party. There needs to be more education that is not correct. And in addition, resident assistants can reach a large population of students. So the students would attend different sessions um, of a presentation of the aforementioned necessary five topics. Resident assistants and student athletes already have implemented in their schedules different, um, different meetings and different educational necessities for other areas. So this is, could be easily implemented. And following each program, we would request student feedback for the effectiveness, relevancy, and importance using qualitative and quantitative responses so that we can adjust this to the needs of the student body and what they think they need the education on most. Finally, we can um, pass out around posters with QR codes to the resident assistants in their halls. They can have access to this presentation, and they can, again, as well, respond, give feedback, and let us know essentially what they want to hear about opioids and how to keep themselves safe. So in conclusion, the program would be focusing on the VW campus and student body, and it will provide resources for treatment interventions and information for students who are becoming increasingly in danger of succumbing to the opioid epidemic. Furthermore, it is built to fit the needs of the VW students based on the issues and concerns that they personally experience. And the program should aim to reduce societal stigma around drugs in a way that shows students the dangers of opioids and how to keep themselves and their friends safe in an increasingly dangerous world. Thank you.
Thank you, Rianne. I think another uh, round of applause for all three of our finalists this evening. Thank you very much. As you see, they're very diverse projects that have uh, gone as well with majors, some without, some passions as well. It's, uh, it's exciting to see the wealth and de depth and variety of intellectual curiosity from the students of the Baton Honors College. And let's have a round of applause for all of our student researchers this evening. It is at this time we get to present the awards. The awards this evening tonight, um, uh, the first award that we'll be awarding tonight is the Audience Choice Award. The Audience Choice Award is going to poster number 13. Oh, is that Erica Eichelberger? Yes, it is. Huh? Come in. Come on, stand up. Just stand up. Erica will receive a check, a forthcoming check for $100 because they didn't have a chance to get that done because we didn't know who won. So congratulations <laughs> as well. Our three finalists are winners of their own accord as well. Each of them will receive a cash prize. Two of the finalists will receive a $250 award. It's a $125 cash prize as well as a $125 donation to your chosen organization in your name and honor, hopefully to spawn and spur and inspire uh, more philanthropy from all of the BHC students throughout your lives towards those environmental sustainability uh, uh, causes and also the Baton Honors College of Virginia Wesleyan University. Feel free to give back on next Bob's birthday uh, as well. But also the, the finalist tonight and the prize winner for the Ryan Prize Award is established by Louis, uh, Louis and Prue Ryan is awarded $1,500, $750 cash and $750 donation to that organization of their choosing. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite uh, board chair John Pruden and Dr. Scott Miller forward as we present this evening's winner of the Ryan Prize Award. And when they join us up here for a photo as well. And uh, again, tonight, thank you all for all this, uh, for all the work this evening, for all you've done throughout your time here at Virginia Wesleyan. And it is my honor to announce that the Ryan Prize for 2024 is awarded to Brianna Mahoney. one of you, Eddie and Rianne, please see me afterwards as well for your um, envelopes. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, as well. At this time, I would uh, provide a few thank yous. I would like to thank Dr. Jill Sturt's Assistant Dean to the Baton Honors College as well for all your help and assistance in this, as well as our office staff, Elaine Lichten Walner, Kaysa Dayton, and Megan Setlack, and Kai Trehan as well. So for all your help in presenting these and getting everything ready for this uh, this dinner would not have happened, though, without the express help of Shelley Hunter, the President's Office. Thank you, Shelley. Abby Mahoney and Sam Crawford, thank you for your assistance here in the tech assistance and setup. And Kelly Cordova for coordinating as well. As well as from Sodexo, Heather Beatty, and uh, as well for helping set up tonight's dinner. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the Batten professors with us here this evening. If you are a Batten professor in the Batten Honors College, please stand to be recognized for your assistance and service to the Batten Honors College. I am proud to work with all these faculty members in the Baton Honors College and the faculty members at BWU, and it is truly incredible to work with all of you students. Our finalists are just a small representation of the incredible work going on here at Virginia Wesleyan University. As we close, I'd like to offer a quote that I found helpful in my own understanding of the climate challenges we face. In the book All We Can Save, an anthology of essays and poems on climate change written by and exclusively by women, editors Ayanna Johnson and Katherine Wilkinson write, this is an era of transformation. This is generations of work. 
If no one has ever invited you to the climate movement, please consider this your warm welcome. And if no one has ever thanked you for your efforts, please hear our gratitude. You are important to this moment. You are so needed. The work at hand is hard and uncertain, yet we find our warrior spirits charge ahead and care for one another every step of the way. We will stumble as we chart this unmapped path. Let's forgive our fallibility, safeguard our empathy, and lead with kindness as we go. Thank you all this evening. Safe travels and have a good evening.